we all die once but we all live so many days in our lifetime instead of fearing death make the most of the day that you are alive create create more platforms like yours through which we can reach out to more people to say that cancer is not a death sentence please come up talk about it because when you talk about it you inspire others hello everyone today i welcome you on our platform sugar shell brands today we have come here with another interesting and important topic that is palliation and bereavement counseling around cancer care to take this discussion ahead i welcome madam vandana mahajan madam vandana mahajan is palliative care counselor with a post graduate diploma in integrative counseling she is trained in palliative and bereavement counseling she is associated with mumbai based cancer non government organization named cope with cancer mother trust she also worked as a volunteer counselor at the tata memorial hospital pro bono and also she provides cancer counseling to patient across india and abroad via online platform she is herself a cancer survivor Hello ma'am we welcome you on our platform thank you shushmita um thank you for a very very warm and uh, lovely introduction it's my pleasure being here and uh, and holding uh, the space with you all to spread awareness about cancer so uh thank you again for having me here to start with our discussion ma'am I request you if you can share some takeaways and important lessons you like to share with our audience about your journey with cancer. So as Shushmita said that I am a cancer survivor too. Um you can see the scar on my neck. I don't hide my scar. It's been 12 and a half years uh, since I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed with follicular um with follicular carcinoma with Hertel cell um changes. Uh, in my thyroid gland um uh, it all was a very coincidental uh, finding my husband that time was serving in the indian army and we were posted in northeast and as all women you know like to indulge themselves i was also putting moisturizer on my face and i felt a hard lump here um we were in a remote area where uh, not uh, you know the the general hospital was a very small unit uh, i I uh, was it keeping very well during that time I um, had a uh, um, severe diarrhea you know it would continue for long periods of time and uh, no medication would help I started feeling weak I started feeling um, you know uh, tired I was in my normal self I've always been a very uh, upbeat very um, healthy very sprightly person but that period I wasn't keeping very well but uh, i was told it's nothing maybe that it's goiter in your thyroid gland anyways we traveled to delhi my daughter with my daughter and investigations followed uh, which revealed that um, i had uh, malignancy in the thyroid gland so thyroid malignancies are rare it was uh, found out that i had a rare i had an aggressive kind of thyroid cancer which is hertel cell um, my with uh, at the time of diagnosis the doctor said it has to immediately go so the first surgery happened post my first surgery i lost my voice um, i it took many years to find my voice back so what you see here today um it's taken quite an effort to get it back i suffer from voice fatigue that means just as your body gets tired my voice gets tired so i have an auto cut i i can't gossip for too long then um, post my first surgery Um, you know biopsy said it's very malignant and uh, therefore i was taken in for a second surgery second surgery my entire thyroid gland was removed and uh, 3 days post into post um, my second surgery i underwent a cardiac arrest my i flat lined i mean uh, my heart stopped i was revived in the nick of time and uh, i was told i went into something known as uh, calcium shock So for uh, you guys listening calcium shock is rigor mortis. So rigor mortis sets in when a human body dies. But I saw myself die. Um so my cheeks went in, my eyes were wide open, my mouth didn't close, my tongue rolled up. My hands were like this. And I I actually saw myself die. I think probably I'm one of the rare ones. 
uh, since that day i've been told um, that uh, um, if i don't take my wife told i know i'm on a very heavy dose of medication calcium basically and if i don't take my calcium today i will die tomorrow and uh, then started my uh, cancer treatment this was before the treatment so all post and pre surgery <coughs> so the cancer treatment uh, is very different um, it you know it's unlike chemotherapy it's uh, in thyroid cancer um, the patient goes through something known as radio ablation where uh, the patient is made to drink um uh, radioactive iodine so i was radio ablated and in that uh, my body became radioactive i was um, injurious i was hazardous to anything living so there was a makeshift isolation room that was made in the hospital and i was put in that room for 4 days i had no human contact um no one could meet me i was i was like i said i was more like a the leak at in the chernobyl plant if you know you know the chernobyl disaster that happened and um, i was in a awful shape uh, my high tsh was up to 150 and post that my follow ups uh, pretty much similar kept happening for 6 years in those 6 years there were multiple times in which i was told that the cancer is back because the cancer that i have travel could travel to the bones but fortunately i gave it a miss and 6 um, years later i was in remission today i'm alive i'm grateful to be alive i live with multiple comorbidities i mean i don't want to uh, take time to talk about it but um, it's been a roller coaster ride and um, my family my husband my daughter my parents my papa my brother and my sister my in-laws they've been a huge support to me huge support and i firmly believe that cancer is not a fight of the patient alone okay. it is of the family together and uh, yeah so here i am and, and and the fear and the scare doesn't end uh, i keep periodically keep undergoing these you know scans and pet scans and fortunately god's been kind but yes the body is taken a beating and um, yeah, some days are tough but then yes like i said it's good to be alive thank you ma'am for sharing your journey with us it was indeed inspiring and hope our audience get some strength to hear that from you thank you ma'am thank you for sharing that shushmita i think uh, Uh, the lesson that i've learned is that um, it's very is is very simple i i believe that uh, we all die once but we all live so many days in our lifetime so instead of instead of fearing that make the most of the day that you're alive true, true. that's what i've learned <laughs> the best quote and uh, truly inspiring ma'am i hope our audience also get inspired and look up to you for more guidance so ma'am as you have been counseling lots of patients and survivors in this area uh, so what are the major questions you generally come across with respect to the emotional well being physical well being financial options and etc you know shushmita not too much emphasis is is laid on the emotional impact of the disease our uh, you know the cancer treatment has made a lot of advancement our oncologists are world class they're they're brilliant there are so many treatment options available but something the emotional support is lacking so uh, that thank you for asking that question um if you are referring to breast cancer patients then um, i do these counsel uh, these interactive sessions with breast cancer patients and and the area of concern i think i would say rather the question that come up are number 1 why did this happen to me number 2 is will it record number 3 is uh, will i ever be able to lead a normal life um number 4 is is it genetic can it go on to my children um uh, number 5 is am i going to die um and uh, and um and number 6 is the fear of death looming on on you know looming large with every patient at the time so these are you know some of the areas that uh, 
areas of concern I would say that the patients have and uh, these need to be addressed. Um, in our society, uh, or maybe I would say in India, there is a huge div divide between urban and rural India. Um, a lot of patients that I counsel come from rural India. And, um, and, and, and as it is the stigma attached to the disease is so big, um, but also there is this myth that cancer is contagious. Question also comes up, kya cancer chut ki bimari hai? Uh, talking about the uh, struggling questions which they come up, is there any sort of questions with respect to how to handle finance or how to handle or uh, talk to their parents or friends or so uh, society taboo related questions? Very often, just with that, cancer treatment is not, uh, an, uh, I don't say it's an affordable treatment, you know, even if it's um, even if it's uh, a regular treatment, which uh, in terms of, um, you know, finances is affordab affordable in the minds of the treating team. That may not be affordable for the patient. The financial strain is, is a huge burden on the patient. And um, a lot of times the patients don't have the money to go ahead with the treatment. Sadly, very sadly. And it breaks my heart that uh, there is so much inequity in healthcare that the economically secured can get the treatment, whereas the same person who is economically vulnerable has the treatment options but can't afford. So, so in my mind, you know, I would say poverty equals death in India, and we need to change that. Uh, and also you asked me about society, um, the societal mindset towards cancer has to change, Shushmita. There is such a huge stigma attached to cancer and my, my one of the areas that I work towards is destigmatizing cancer. And uh, that's why I, I, you know, I come up um, and conduct these talks because till we destigmatize this disease, it will remain uh, the disease of death. So the society's approach also, for example, I'll give you my example. When I was detected with cancer and after my treatment, we went back to the to the area where my husband was posted, you know, in hushed tones, people would say, oh, Vandana Mahaji, you know, she got cancer. And and that would give me, uh, not, would actually make me very angry. And uh, I remember um, somebody came up to me and said, we are so sorry that you have cancer and I just could not um, take it. <laughs> Something just burst inside of me. I croaked that time and I told that person, sir, please don't feel sorry for me. I'm alive and standing on my feet. So, so, so this whole stigma around the disease um, has to be busted and the society needs to give a rethink towards how the disease is viewed. This is not a death sentence. Cancer is no longer a death sentence. If it's detected on time, it's curable. If it's a late stage cancer, there are multiple options available. So um, I think uh, that's how the that's where the society needs to um, retweak their approach towards cancer. And family members. Uh, Shushmita, what do I say about the family members? My family was also petrified. Even now, every time, you know, the doctor says, we, we think, you know, you need to undergo a PET scan. Everybody in my family starts hyperventilating because the cancer that comes back is never a good cancer. So, um, um, the family is scared because uh, they love you, they love us. Um, and, uh, but also, um, it's important to make a point here is that family goes through their own set of burdens and distress um, which again is not really spoken about um, the family the, the caregivers uh, you know are they making the right decision where will they get the finances from what if something happens to my loved one so they live with that fear and no and um, very few people address that um, the the pain of the caregiver so that's how it impacts the, the family. Uh, if you can talk 
further on this point uh, about social stigma so what are the major factors one can uh, put as a awareness to others so that we can talk more about it and spread awareness around it so that we can remove the stigma out of social uh, space yeah yeah first of all i think we need to create create more platforms like yours through which we can reach out to more people to say that cancer is not a death sentence please come up talk about it because when you talk about it you inspire others you know um when i talk of, of my journey i'm sure it inspires many who are presently going through cancer if i could i could do it they can also do it so that is one thing um the areas where we need to work towards uh, raising awareness is um women health women are um in spite of being the, the i would say the the backbone of the family are still um sidelined a woman's job is to take care of her family her pair, uh, her, her husband her children her in-laws the extended family take care of the house she doesn't take care of herself um so that is why uh, that the breast cancer uh is um, is becoming such a big um, i would say gaining the um the it, it gaining the proportion of an epidemic that's how much you know uh, women cancers are for uh, cervical cancer breast cancer ovarian cancer are detected late because women do not pay heed to their body to their health uh, another area would be i would say how to destigmatize would be include the community we don't include the community you know like for example if i have cancer i need to create a social group or a support group which can go out go out and um, reach out to other people hey look i went through this journey and it's okay um next would be i would say death death is an inevitability we don't talk about that so it's not only cancer that causes death there are so many other things that also cause death so equating cancer to the death is not right um and also what would i say um is family involvement um i i stress a lot on this shishmita that um, for example uh, you know the woman of the house she forgets herself so much um uh, and by the time she comes to us for treatment or reaches the hospital for treatment the cancer is advanced so it is important for the for the for the men the children um and the family members to come together and remind the woman that yes please take care of yourself we are there for you we are going to hold you so uh, we are going to take care of you but if you are not okay who's going to take care of the family so that also can happen only when every member of the family uh you know comes together for the woman of the house so these are some areas i would say shishmita uh, which uh, need to be looked into and we can um bring about a, a perception the change in the perception towards cancer Yes, ma'am. You are rightly said, and in fact, while talking to various cancer patients myself, I come across the major points they like to highlight is about uh, family support. Unless that one cannot go through this, uh, and I strongly support what you mentioned right now. And uh, we are in that how we can uh, take this up and uh, remove the stigma around cancer. yeah and also uh, you know i see uh, educated people uh, shying away from talking about this if a, if a family if a family educated family gets you know somebody in the family gets diagnosed with cancer i have actually known so many who say hush we don't want to talk i don't know why so that uh, approach needs to needs to be changed i mean there are people like me who are very upfront uh, about having gone through cancer but there are a lot still i would say the majority refuses to talk about it. Mm-hmm. education awareness 
uh, community support i think is what can bring about this change uh, ma'am another point i like to uh, draw your attention here is according to the statistics uh, uh, related to breast cancer in india so what i have observed out of our research is there is a shift from uh, uh, 50 plus as a patient shifting to younger generation that is 30 plus even so what are their major concerns and how you address that if you can like to comment on that yeah so i think that's again a very a good point that you raised shushita um if you talk of breast cancer uh, earlier breast cancer was um, actually diagnosed in perimenopausal women or menopausal women. now young women in their 30s and 40s a lot of them are also getting diagnosed and i we've had cases where women in their 20s unmarried women are also getting diagnosed um so this is a very sad tra- uh, i would say trend that's come in um, and um, the perception um what would you mean by perception here uh, i mean that their approach age by shushmita ma'am uh, majorly with respect to uh, their mental condition and how they are coping up with respect to family with husband maybe or overall society career so they they uh, they have their life ahead to you know carry on uh, yeah. so what are the differences and how how you are uh, addressing to that okay so i uh, see uh, older women i'll talk of the older women uh older women mostly they've had their children okay uh they've lived uh, i would say about 60 70 60% of their lives um they aging any which ways right so a lot of things for example uh, you know they don't have the fear of would they be able to conceive would they be able to breastfeed um um and and a lot of them don't really are not um concerned too much about their body image issues also right um and um um so so for them uh, the areas of concern would be will the disease come back um um uh, how long will i live um and will my family still accept um whereas in the younger women younger women first would be body image issue if it's uh, you know if you talk about mastectomy losing a breast is a loss of confidence in it when you know you and i are women when we look at ourselves in the mirror we like to see ourselves as you know with two breast hole but if a woman was to lose her breast it would i be able to uh, have a intimate relationship with my husband uh, um can sex still happen um and um i think in both the age groups um one of the areas of concern is can cancer pass on from me to my husband or from the husband to the wife so that is also you know when they intimate um, can um, the, the sexual act cause the cancer to be transferred um another uh, would be a lot of women uh, who are planning children for them it's a huge setback because the treatment um, affects the ovaries which in turn affects the quality of the ova so um the women who come from rural areas for them marriage equals to having children and if uh, for some reason they are not um you and i know how they are treated in our indian society uh, and also um a lot of women uh, get abandoned by their families which is common in both the age groups what happens is like i said cancer treatment is expensive um and it is a long term treatment plus uh, the patient who goes through the treatment has side effects which are um, which are not pleasant it needs a lot of patience it needs a lot of family support it needs a lot of care and concern from the family um like not that. all of them get it yes not all of them get it and i've seen where in between the treatment the the woman is abandoned so these are some of the areas of concern i think common ones and the few for both the age groups uh, but uh, but also here you know now uh, there are ways to help them deal with it for example in younger women are given the option of reconstruction 
right? Um, and also for both younger, I mean, any woman who wants the option of reconstruction is provided reconstruction. And we see a lot of younger women opting for reconstruction. Um, these days, um, well, you know, mastectomy is the, is, is the last option. Last option, yes. Last option. The, onco, the, the oncosurgeon tries to preserve the breast. Now, then there is the option of wearing a prosthesis. Uh, which gives the confidence uh, to the woman that she is going I agree that uh, as the medical advancement is uh, going on in this area, a lot of research is going on and how we can conserve the body part and uh, try to uh, do the mastectomy will be the last option. But still, uh, ma'am, uh, I'd like to ask if th- such ca- kind of questions come across with is related to inner ways if I say uh, that, uh, that what are the major problems they face while uh, wearing inner ways or in fact uh, also uh, prosthetics uh, in the area of say the uh, skin irritation um, any sort of back pains, any sort of um, uh, sweat sweat related problems or any sort of uh, movement related problems. So if you ca- if you come across, uh, please uh, suggest uh, how we can improve as a innerwear uh, brand that, uh, and incorporate in our products. Yeah, so again, this is a very, very good question. Um, now, for example, uh, uh, in fact, what every woman post surgery, irrespective of whether she undergoes a mastectomy or removal of a lump or removal of you know nodes, uh, is advised post surgery to wear a bra. Okay, so here the fear of pain is always there. So we tell them to wear cotton bras, hosiery bras, through which exchange of air can happen, which do not hurt. Um, there are some women who don't feel comfortable wearing uh, the hook, the bras with the hook. So we tell them to wear a sports bra. Um, the elderly women uh, from a rural India, after a certain age, they stop wearing bras, unfortunately. Now, uh, if a woman's undergone surgery, we insist. So for them, the thought of a bra is, we to have to put it on, we to Right, um, and also um, it is important to highlight the importance of wearing a prosthesis post mastectomy. A lot of women who undergo mastectomy are not aware that, in addition to the um, the aesthetic reason, there is a medical reason also of wearing a, a prosthesis. So uh, we need to talk about these, and also we need to tell them that. Uh, like you said, because whatever processes they wear or the bra they wear, it's going to be touching their skin. Um, so it can, if it's not comfortable material, it can cause abrasions, it can cause bruising. Um, if there are stitches, it can cause the stitches to get infected. So therefore, uh, the bra or the bra should be cotton or hosiery. We discourage them from wearing synthetic or lacy bras till surgery the sutures are removed uh, and uh, also we, t- we talk about the hygiene part of it here hygiene is also very important that uh, wearing clean uh, undergarments um, uh, is also important and also uh, why a bra should be Right. So uh, here we do talk about how supporting the breast is important for surgery. So again, the right kind of bra is important. Um, and uh, in addition to this, we also emphasize that when they go out, suppose they're wearing a blouse, they don't want one side of the, if it's a mastectomy patient, they, they don't want one side of the bra, blouse to be vacant, empty, hardly. So we tell them um, to use a bra. Uh, so they, you know, uh, they feel confident about their body. So I would say uh, these are the areas of concern, and uh, this is what we tell them about what type of bra to wear. Great, ma'am. So, uh, what are your general uh, suggestions to such patients? Um, 
for example i, I have come across with many patients uh, who generally uh, kind of compromise uh, with respect to prosthetics by doing something uh, in uh, diy kind of prosthetics at home and uh, they wear it and they don't uh, open up to go out and reach out to uh, some shop or uh, doctors maybe uh, who can give such products uh, which is very much essential for them after surgery so what suggestions or uh, like what comments you wish to say on this yeah so shishita uh, see uh, wearing uh, if i'm talking about uh, the use of a prosthesis prosthesis pros- using a prosthesis is mandatory why uh, because um, for example you know um, like why for example when a woman grows up she has two breasts right the weight of both the breast is is uh, it's somewhat equal to somebody now if one side of the breast is removed uh, the weight on the other side will increase so if the woman does not use the prosthesis in order to maintain the body balance i would say the center of gravity the 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 spinal cord starts um, you know um, starts i would say um, you know bend, bending bending towards one side because the body will bend to maintain the balance yeah. and when that happens it is not going to be very perceptible but the woman will complain of various aches and pains in the muscles in the joints therefore it is imperative that the backbone be kept straight and the prosthesis is used but again the prosthesis that are available in the market are expensive the good quality ones and it becomes a privilege of the rich i interact with women um, you know from rural india and the moment we tell them that there are prosthesis in the range of 3000 to 6000 they will not pay it just for them it's not important yes so um, therefore it is very important that we create something which is affordable to them even if we tell them the importance the lack of money prevents them for buying something for themselves because they are they, they it's first of all it's unaffordable second because it's a woman she is a woman so woman is not priority um so these are two things i think which uh, uh, i would like to emphasize it's affordable and does the purpose of uh, medically helping them it's not only cosmetically or aesthetically it has to be medically appropriate for them for the for the patient so these uh, two things have to be kept in, kept into mind um, you know when you design the bras that you are creating i think the, the, it's a wonderful idea that you uh, are working on and uh, it will benefit a lot of women provided it's within their budget right right i agree ma'am and uh, there are uh, different strata of income uh, groups so we are targeting that how we can address uh, in that respect uh, so that uh, it not only uh, aesthetically but definitely medically Hy- hygiene uh, is also important so we are targeting that area as well so we yeah. are having a various range uh, of products so that we can address that uh, yeah. um, so can i can i can i just um, say something here shishmita when you talk of hygiene i missed talking about this there are processes uh, you know um, which are cheap which are available say 300 400 but those cannot be washed right right if they wash those processes the shape of the processes changes and also those processes do not have weight in them so they those are cos for cosmetic purposes yeah so uh, i think just uh, we're making processes which uh, uh, make the woman feel physically whole um, should not be the purpose i agree on this ma'am and also uh, drawing attention uh, on sports bra uh, i had a discussion with couple of doctors who are oncologist breast cancer oncologist so they mentioned very important point uh, regarding uh, the compression of uh, sports bra so they definitely suggest to wear a, a sports bra just immediately after the surgery 
but there is a mismatch with respect to the uh, cus- uh, the patient and doctor so the patient don't feel comfortable after uh, wearing sports bra after the surgery in general because of that compression and second is regarding the hand movements uh, while wearing it so there is a mismatch uh, of suggestion and using it uh, so what are your thoughts on this and uh, but i think what the oncologists say uh, is absolutely to be followed they know to to use about it um, because they are the experts if they say that a compression garment has to be worn by a certain patient that patient has to wear it um because it's medically correct correct therefore they have, therefore at that time the patient needs to be counseled about why she needs to wear it till she knows the why she will keep fidgeting because see anything that you wear over your stitches is going to be uncomfortable right so it's important to tell the patient why it's needed um so once you tell uh, them the why i'm sure everybody uh, will understand and uh, there'll be no um, confusion on that regard that's really well said yes ma'am so we we will surely follow that and uh, we are on to make the sports bra which is comfortable for uh, patients uh, keeping in mind the ha- restricted hand movements and other areas that is compression which they feel uh, in general which is affecting them so we are trying to figure it out and uh, make designs around that which uh, align with doctors uh, points Uh, yeah that i in fact i was just going to say this that you must consult um breast oncologists breast yeah. surgeons for this because they'll be able to guide you about what kind of garment uh, would be suitable for which surgery because there are different types of surgeries right mm-hmm. right there is com- there's complete mastectomy there's partial mastectomy there's reconstruction there is lumpectomy the yes. removal of nodes from the axilla so i think it's important that you stay in touch with them yes ma'am yes ma'am definitely ma'am we are uh, on to that and uh, i am also i like to know more about uh, the counseling part so that our audience who are listening can understand that where to reach out when they are in need uh, emotionally and other factors um see um, i am a palliative care counselor and most of the time people associate palliative care towards a terminal disease or a patient with terminal cancer or patient who is dying um that's not the case palliative means uh, it means a, a holistic healing of the patient so palliative integration should happen at the time of the diagnosis uh, shushmita it's not at stage 3 or stage 4 or when the patient is on best supportive care palliative treatment should be integrated irrespective of the stage of the disease i'm a counselor when a see uh, an oncologist um an oncology surgeon takes care of the physical part of the disease a patient goes through a lot of emotional distress i i have been through the journey and i know when i was going to this uh, journey through my cancer treatment i had no emotional support and till that emotional support is provided by a counseling we cannot heal the patient in totality cancer leaves a lot of scars a lot of scars uh, and uh, the the physical scars um uh, still heal the emotional scarring um gets etched in their psyche sometimes you know so it it's very important to have a counselor on board who understands cancer it's, it, you know um, i would say the counselor has to have an understanding of cancer because cancer counseling is very different from other kinds of counseling so that's how important counseling is um, uh, and uh, i think everybody should uh, include it as a part of it and any any uh, important points you like to comment on uh, how to counsel the family members because they also get very uh, upset or uh, like their mental condition is also important to boost can, uh, the patient so so how we can do that 
caregivers, uh, I think we can call the caregivers silent patients. They are the silent patients. They're taking care of the patients um, by being unacknowledged. And a lot of caregivers um, actually um, tend to sh uh, shove their own troubles under the carpet because they feel guilty. Yes. That because my loved one is going through such a dangerous disease, how can I express my distress? And um, caregiver burnout is also very common. Caregivers get depressed, they, they get stressed, they um, contract illnesses because of the stress. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as a counselor, I make it a point to counsel both the patient and the caregiver. So that understanding how that can happen is when you have a have a counselor uh, on board uh, with the treatment plan, and also. Um, the caregiver has to be comfortable talking to them. That's wonderful. And, and also, yeah, and also, and also, Shmita, we need to keep raising awareness about mental health, which is again, uh, you know, a huge stigma attached to it. Why should I go? It's my responsibility. Why should I go? I've been diagnosed with, uh, with a disease like this. A healthy mind, an emotionally stable person. Um, can deal with the physical side effects so much better. Exactly, ma'am. I totally agree, and we are trying our best how we can uh, put this forward as awareness. Uh, and thank you, ma'am, for doing this with us. I believe many of uh, patients and, in fact, survivors who are going through lots of trauma in their uh, own space must be reach out to you for help and uh, looking forward to you for more such kind of um, uh, talks so that we can uh, keep on uh, uh, spreading the awareness around it so ma'am any any last comments you wish to wish to address yes um i think it's together um if you work together um alone i cannot do it alone you cannot do it alone an oncologist cannot do it so alone a patient cannot do it only when we all come together can we um, uh, close the care gap. Yes. That's the that's the theme of um, the World Cancer Day this time. Close the care gap. And also, I just want to touch a little about the NGO that I'm associated with. Um, um, it's called Cope with Cancer Mother Trust. And one of our major activities, in addition to the funding, uh, you know, for treatment, for surgeries, um, emotional support, we provide free wigs to to all post chemo patients. Pan India. Pan India. So we don't charge anything for it. If you're not in Mumbai, we will have it couriered to you at your place of residence. So you can visit our website and uh, get the details. That's wonderful, ma'am. And I'll put all the details in the end of this video so that uh, people who wants to reach up, up to you, uh, that person can do. So thank you. Definitely. And it was pleasant uh, talking to you. A lot of learnings we had. We come to know a lot of important areas which we should focus so that these things uh, come up in a better way and we can address better uh, quality to them. Can I can I add something here, Shushmita? Yeah. Um, since you're designing inner wear, uh, all women like to wear good inner wear, <laughs> right? Uh, so generally, generally, um, you know, these we call it the pocket wali bra. Right, right. The right. mastectomy bras are generally white and beige. So I think maybe you can give it a thought um, of um, making it an attractive colors. Um, that is what we are trying to put it that this is not a medical or basic bra, but there will be lots of color, uh, lots of uh, fancy, in fact, but not uh, affecting their health. So we are trying to put all the lace. Uh, attached with a um, uh, cotton uh, uh, surface so that when it is touching to the skin it should it should not irritate the skin so this is how we are designing and we have a first range right now but we are improving to get more and more better products uh, uh, so that we can target um, 30 plus uh, women 50 plus women who are interested in uh, doing yoga or uh, other kind of sports gymming that area but uh, it should uh, focus the medical part as well so we are trying to yes. in that respect 
Yeah, and and that is one way of getting normalcy back in life. Exactly. Everything should not be every, everything should not be medical. Exactly. They can leave, they can wear clothes like the others. Just like uh, we purchase uh, online, it should be yeah, absolutely kind of experience. Yes. Absolutely, a red, blue, green, pink, anything. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you for thinking of that. <laughs> It is lovely talking to you, ma'am, uh, and we are looking forward for more such kind of conversations, and uh, and all the details uh, about ma'am and about sugar shell will be uh, there in uh, next week uh, in the later side of the video. Please check it, and you can contact us accordingly. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shushmita, for giving me this opportunity. All the very best to you. Thank you, ma'am. It was lovely talking to you. we saw what a incredible personality who went through lots of personal challenges and experiences from losing her speech to cancer to transforming herself as a lifelong dedicated counselor to cancer survivors ma'am you are a great example of great determination and positive attitude towards life thank you ma'am for giving this a wonderful opportunity and sharing a lovely moment with us